to kick us off, what I'd like to do is just ask each of my panelists just to um, have their opening remarks and comments around the work that each of their specific organizations are doing to actually address this current issue of skills mismatch. Um, I'll start with you, Ravi, if you could just please share with us and um, the colleagues in the room what you um, and the YES team led by yourself are actually doing to contribute to somewhat trying to solve this really huge and multi-layered challenge that we have. All right, thanks very much. Um, so maybe let me start with a few things which are perhaps setting a bit of a context for the mismatch between uh, skills and employment and, and the rest. So the first is I think that as a country, our spending on education and skills, public funding is quite high. Mm -hmm. So we typically come top two or top three in the world ratings. But our uh, results are uh, towards the bottom. Mm -hmm. So the spending's up here and the results are towards, towards the bottom. So if you take the World Economic Forum for uh, maths and science, out of 139 countries, we came 139. And then someone will say, well, you know, the fact is it's a bit subjective. But then if you look at the Pearl study, which I'm sure many of you have looked at, and you, I think it was, 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 was also mentioned in the introduction, where do grade uh, force, uh, 10 year olds, you know, can they read for meaning? Again, it's consistently very low. So the one challenge, and it comes back to what Yes is trying to do as well, is it's not so much the money, but there's an institutional problem that has to be dealt with. Because if you put more money in mm. and you have the same institutional problems, you're not going to get a good, uh, a, a good value for money out of that. So I think that's the first, uh, you know, the first thing. The second thing which YES is now trying to do in, its, uh, in terms of the context is when we say South Africa is at the bottom, it's not, you know, there's different South Africans. <clears throat> so the so, so if you can divide up the South African uh, uh, learner cohorts into different segments, and a lot, and it and it does link a lot to historical privilege mm -hmm. and income class, and you know the schools you go to and all of that. But I, what we would find is that ten percent of the learner group in South Africa would be at very high international level, like your Ivy League mm -hmm. type thing, and the and then. And you have about 50%, which would be primarily those coming from the worst performing public schools who are very disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. Now, when you come to the issue of how technology is changing, I can tell you that 10%, and let's say the top 25% are all using ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. They're using DALI and MidJourney, all the programs. They already know. They're on par with the best in the world. In the bottom 50%, uh, very, very different. And in terms of how you can see things are going to bifurcate and just sort of separate, the ones who have access are just going to accelerate faster, and the ones that don't are going to fall behind faster. So there is a challenge about, uh, and so the one recommendation I'd give immediately to the Tabu Beki Foundation is we need to focus on the bottom 50%, because mm -hmm. everyone focuses on the top 50% and all of the bottom 50% is where the challenge is. That's where your pearls results are bad and mm -hmm. all of that. And I can tell you, having been in the HRD council for 10 years, it was a big challenge to get that as a focus. But I think if you could move that, you know, so it's good we got a top 10% that is world class. Mm -hmm. But the challenge is you can't have a situation where 50% of the population are in schools which are chronically underperforming. Mm -hmm. They are very good public schools, but they're uh, the third thing, uh, and now this is, comes close to, to now why YES was formed as a youth employment service, is the relationship between, the uh, bet between schools, post-school, and employment is very poor. Mm -hmm. So you'd find, so at school, that's when people must be prepared for work, the future of work, and all of that. And post-school, that's where, you know, you bring it much more tightly towards uh, the labor market planning or assessments and scenarios of the future and, and, and where companies are now looking for the people who are in the 18 to or the 15 to 24 uh, brackets and, and, and who are being prepared. And I, I, I'll just share the one, the one point on this is when I remember at the HRD Council going to look, go to visit the TVET College. We do a lot of side visits 
and it was a nice one, it had a lot of stuff in it, but there were no relationships with the uh, private sector. So I was, well, how are you preparing people for work in the motor industry, this was, if there are no motor companies mm. advising you on what the person must come out with? Because in the feedback, when you met the car companies, yeah, we have to retrain them anyway. So we, we, we so they, so, but it seemed like such a waste of money, resources, and, and, and the youth's time. Because if you're going to go into that thing, be prepared. There's Ford, there's Nissan, they're connected, they go, they're, they're almost your supervisors. Mm -hmm. So I think how you, uh, and for some reason, we, I, I think even as a government over these last years, we haven't really forged a tight enough relationship as other countries have between the, uh, the, the public sector programs and the private sector employers. So YES then was set up as initiative of the private sector by a thing called the CEO initiative where all the companies got together and they said, look, there's a big challenge where uh, obviously youth employment can't continue these levels, even though the private sector is not going to run a public works program, but let it at least have a pipeline of bright talent from the poorest families and get them into the right things where at least they can start coming into the private sector. And the private sector would pay for the whole thing. And uh, so that's what YES was created as. It's 100% funded by the private sector. It's done 132,000 internships, 12-month internships, which makes the biggest 12-month internship program in the country, private or public. And last year we did 33,000. And 75% uh, of them work for a year in a company. So BMW, Anglo-American, famous brands, whatever it is. And uh, the companies employ about 25% more people than they can take in-house. And then they say, uh, tell me, Ravi, what do I do with the 25%? And we say, okay, why don't we try to jointly build an industry? Let's build a drones industry. So we'll train these guys to be drone pilots, because then everyone needs drone pilots. Or why don't we... Uh, take some of them and put them into training to be solar PV. Mm -hmm. uh, now we're working with companies to, uh, to, to, to strengthen some of the tourism bodies to bring more tourists into the country because that's a big job creator. So we're working with uh, you know, the uh, Tourism Business Council, VNA Waterfront, there's a whole range of departments around that. And then AI as well. Mm -hmm. So we said, look, we want everyone, even if the person comes from a background where they have never worked with computers before. Now they're just working with ShopRite and it's warehousing. But we all know warehousing is going to change because of technology. There's going to be an AI program and robotics. And, and we want our you know, 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 people in the program to add. So even though I can't solve the problem for enough million, but the 300,000 will be a meaningful uh, um, labor force that will now be equipped with technology and you know, at least they can go into the communities and do stuff. So we got about 1,600 companies, uh, which again, that's the biggest pool of sponsoring private companies. And that's where we don't do training. This is the thing. So the companies only pay for the internships or not the training. So when we structure, let's say, youths to go into ICT for a year, we would cover the salaries and we would cover which companies they can go to. And then we look, so now we're partnering with the CETA to say, mm -hmm. okay, can you bring some of your training money and then you support us? So we've got our first partnership with the CETA, we're experimenting. Um, and, and so in a way, we're forming a bit of a bridge between the public sector and the private sector. But our focus is very much on where, where's the market going? What do companies want? Uh, what skills are they rejecting? And uh, so that's why a lot of it is now turning towards technology, ICT, and even if you're doing distribution and last mile delivery, you still need to know something about AI. Mm -hmm. So then how do you blend some of these things together? So that's really the, it's, it's very practical. Uh, but, but we have to do a lot of scenario planning and research as well. Thank you so much, Ravi. And definitely I think it sounds like a really well thought out process. And I really like the point that you made around really trying to bridge the gap, you know, and really wanting to understand where things are going rather than reacting because I think part of the problem in, in terms of where we are is being reactionary rather than proactive and looking at where trends are going. You know, you speak about the CETAs, for example. If we look at the list of critical skills that is published by the CETAs, you know, um, and coming from the ICT space, um, technology moves very rapid. 
And one of the key challenges that we have is the list that, that is published by Mixita is four years outdated. Those are not the skills we need right now. Those are skills we needed four years ago. You know, so it's really great to hear the proactivity in terms of saying, where are trains going? You know, thank you so much. Um, Sam, over to you in terms of just sharing with us and um, the room the, with regards to just your initial thoughts just around the topic at hand and then just what your organization is doing to actually contribute to closing this challenge. Thank you very much, Kitsio, and good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, I'll be speaking from an HSRC point and not really from Kodesha since uh, uh, the work we have done on graduate outcomes and skills development has been from the HSRC. I would agree with, the, with Ravi in terms of the fact that the skill gaps uh, problem is really, for me or for us, an issue of, the, of an ecosystem. And we have to look at it from really an overarching point of view. Uh, unfortunately, most institutions have been focusing and doing really great jobs at particular levels, at, at institutional level. Uh, but the, N the NZP tried to provide an overarching document to be able to address some of these case challenges we have. But what we have realized is that uh, institutions keep working in silos and don't have that ecosystem view of what is happening within the system. And that has to do with the kind of policies we have, uh, the education system itself. I mean, one of the basic things that I always say, if you go to some of the, you know, the Nordic countries, the, the Scandinavian countries that have the best education systems in the world, getting a teacher into the classroom is like for, for, for some of our countries, getting a medical doctor or an engineer. It's a very rigorous process to get a teacher qualified to teach. And we have a, a problem where we keep looking at the outputs and the outcomes without looking at the input. What is getting into the system and what needs to get out of the system in terms of the quality? And so, and so that is at, at one level. Of course, the, the next level is the, the kind of training that we have. And Ravi was talking about the link between the practical aspects of the training and the theoretical aspect of the training. And I will speak a lot from the level of the universities because I have done most of the work from graduates, in terms of graduate uh, transition from, from university to, to a level, as opposed to maybe the CITAS and, 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 and training at the TVET level. And you realize that there, there is a lot that goes into the quality, and you talked about the historical legacy in terms of the types of universities and the variance that we have observed across different universities. Uh, but of course, we are faced now with global forces uh, in terms of globalization. And what that means in terms of the training we receive, of course, there are opportunities. You can take on a, a training online, but also it opens up South Africa to different kinds of, 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 of job seekers. And uh, we saw from the concept note that about 300,000 jobs are being offered to non-South Africans working out, outside the shores of South Africa. Of course, that has to play in terms of how many graduates get the opportunity to get into internships, into training at different levels. Uh, the next thing I wanted to do, besides that, 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 that ecosystem view, to now get into the institutions, especially the institutions of, of, higher, of higher learning, from the work we have done, uh, one thing that I, I observed and I've been looking for money to, to do more research on that, even though now I'm between Dakar and, and Pretoria, is the quality and the resourcefulness of the, what we call the career guidance offices. And you realize that these offices have a key role to play in terms of helping first year students uh, to be able to identify what is it that I need to do? What is it I am good, I, I am good at? Not what I am actually performing better at now, but what is it I am made, I am designed, my DNA is formed to be. And I might be facing challenges now, but how can I overcome these challenges? And one of the studies we did, one of the historical advantage universities at the career guidance office, there were 14 staff. And one of the historical disadvantaged universities, there was one staff in that office. And you tell me, how is this staff going to support these this, this young people to be able to understand what they need to do, but even more so to be able to support them through the three or four years of graduate training to be able to, be, to get out into the world of work, to be able to get the skills. And this is something that we really don't talk about, the role of the career guidance offices. 
Adding to that is, as you were saying, the link between the institutions and the, and, and the workforce and, and the private sector and, and the employers. Uh, most of our graduates, and you were making the point before we, 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 we sat down, most of the employers would prefer to get someone who has some kind of, of, of experience. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, most of our graduates, they graduate with cum laude degrees with no experience. And compounding on that, we got evidence from employers who will only employ graduates from, a, from some particular kinds of universities. How do we break this legacy? Uh, how do we break this legacy to, to make sure that not only government departments employ graduates from these universities and the private sector employers employ graduates from these universities or this social class? Because increasingly now it's moving from race and university type to, to class because you have even black graduates of universities but from high social class who get into these opportunities. And of course, uh, I will speak to one or two of the projects that we did. Uh, the one project is for the Council, the, the, the Council for Science, SACNAP, which is the South African Council for Natural Science Professions. So the concern was that natural science graduates move out, out of the natural science into finance, into business, into other fields. And uh, of course, that is a challenge, but that signals something to the system. I was a natural science graduate from my first degree. I'm not doing uh, uh, humanities. There is a capacity to be able to get natural science graduates to get into other aspects of, of society. And it comes back to some of the work that we did at the, at the HSRC, which is TIMS, Trends in Maths and Science Graduate Studies. Uh, and it shows and, and it, it echoes some of the work that, that, that came out from the pearls that South Africa continues to perform uh, from, the, from, from below, head first from below on some of those rankings. Of course, with much progress that has been done, but overall, South Africa can continue to, to perform low. And it comes to the point we're making about the kinds of the historically disadvantaged institutions. But what we also find is that countries like Zimbabwe, Zambia, Nigeria, Ghana, who have similar socioeconomic st status, like some of our uh, 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 quantile three and four schools, perform better than South African graduate uh, uh, school leavers from those, 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 those the grades, either grade seven or grade nine or grade 11, but within similar socioeconomic conditions. So the question is, what are we not doing? Or what need are we doing that is causing our learners and graduates not perform in the maths and science skills? Of course, I am totally for humanities and the arts, uh, but there is evidence that getting some level of maths and science, it's very important going into the labor market, going into society, you will have to use the, those skills in one way or, or the other. I think to conclude uh, my, my open, open, opening remarks is really to say, I think that we as a system are disappointing hundreds and thousands of young South Africans every year, every day. And uh, what I was asking the organizers is, we need to find new ways of thinking, new ways of doing, uh, of being, to be able to address this problem. We, 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 we got the, the figure of the needs. 10 years ago, we were 3.5 million young people between the ages of 16 and 24, not in education, employment, or training. Now it's about 7.5 million of those young people. Uh, and so much is being done but the figure keeps increasing. How do we think radically? How do we flip the coin and flip the table and flip whatever we are doing to be able to move forward? I think we can talk about some of this house uh, in the subsequent uh, sessions. Thank you so much, Sam, and I think it's a great segue into Mampoku um, <laughs> in terms of just really unpacking in terms of our higher education and um, the challenges that we are facing in terms of the output um, that we are getting from our higher education, um, which is directly contributing to young people that are skilled in skills that are not demanded by industry. So um, if you could just share with us your opening remarks as well as um, unpack further just some of the work you are doing to try and contribute to closing this challenge of the skills mismatch. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Katie, for the uh, opportunity. 
I just wanted to start by indicating that South Africa has a good idea of its skills uh, challenges particularly based on the credible evidence and the research that we continue to do. And really, policies such as GIPSA has provided uh, the foundation for that because GIPSA led, led to the uh, establishment of the Human Resource Development uh, Council of South Africa, which really is a coordinating, uh, a coordination structure where constituencies such as business labor, community, government, sit and engage on issues around human resource development and skills planning in the country. And also, GIPSA led, uh, set the foundation for this multi-sectoral as well as multi-stakeholder approach to skills planning in the country. Because really, the work that we are doing right now in the Department of Higher Education and Training be it in terms of development of policies, be it in terms of the identification of skills needs, we always ensure that we do that in collaboration with various stakeholders in South Africa. And lastly, GIPSA laid the foundation for further research and understanding of skills needs in South Africa. And now this is where I, I come in as a, um, uh, as a director mandated to uh, oversee system monitoring and labor market intelligence in South Africa. To say that we have taken forward the work that uh, GIPSA has initiated by ensuring that we're establishing what we call a labor market uh, intelligence uh, research program, which is a government-wide research program to ensure that we try and understand what are the signals and the needs of the labor market so that as a post-school education and training, we are better positioned to respond to those needs. And really this is a one of a kind to, uh, in South Africa, mainly because previously this work was done uh, sectorally by our sector education and training uh, authorities in South Africa. But now with the labor market intelligence, we are able to provide a national picture in terms of what are the skills requirements for social and economic uh, development. We have really uh, established or developed a dedicated research. I think I've put some points I'm gonna share with you because it's important that everybody get access okay. to some of the deliverables that we are producing. We have a dedicated uh, research uh, website, which is uh, our LMI website, where all the deliverables, the list of occupations in high demand, Ketue made reference to the critical skills list, all those can actually be accessed by everybody on the Labor Market Intelligence Partnership uh, project. And really on the conceptualization of this LMI research program, we ensured that we understand how other countries have been doing it before. Mm. By going on a study tour, we went to Europe, we went to Australia, studied their methodologies in terms of building a credible institutional uh, mechanism for skills planning. So to date, there are quite a number of reports that we are producing. Most of them we are producing every two years. Reports such as the list of occupations in high demand, reports such as the skills mismatches report that we're producing in collaboration with OECD, the list of occupations in high demand. And this year, I think around the end of March, we will also be producing a skills gap report to begin to indicate areas where even those that are employed, when they need to upskill and reskill, they need to know where are the shortages or the skills gaps are in, uh, in South Africa. And really just to uh, highlight some of the challenges that we are facing in the context of skills gaps to say that currently 70, 76% of South African companies have reported uh, talent shortages and difficulty in finding people with the right skills. And the report on skills imbalances in South Africa that we have produced as part of the Labor Market Intelligence Research Program shows that 51.5% of workers were mismatched in terms of their qualification level. 
meaning that about 30% of individuals work in occupations for which they require a higher level of uh, 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 qualification. They, they are therefore, 30% uh, are underqualified for the positions that they are currently holding. And we have about 21.5 percentage of workers who are overqualified for the occupations that they are currently holding, which really begins to indicate the sort of challenges that we are experiencing in the country. And again, over, over and above that, we have about 31% of our workers employed in a job that does not match the field of study of their highest qualification. So it is really a challenge. The issue of skills mismatches is really a, a challenge in South Africa. And the report that I've just uh, mentioned that we will be producing now in March uh, about uh, identifying skills gaps in South Africa also shows that the key or the, the major uh, skills gaps that exist across various sectors in South Africa are in leadership, administration and management, planning, organizing, designing, particularly technology design, analyzing conflict resolution, and digital and artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And I've heard my colleagues here talking about the entire value chain, mm -hmm. which is really important, mm -hmm. because what we're doing through the work of, through reconceptualizing the human resource development strategy of South Africa, we are beginning to look at the entire value chain to say that if we are to get this right, if we are to respond to the need of the labor market, we have to ensure that as early as in early childhood uh, development, our learners gets to be taught green skills. You know, they need to have the right, right foundation in green skills. My colleague also highlighted the importance of maths and science. Mm. Because even with the list of occupations in high demand, be it in the IT space or in other various uh, imaging occupations, such as the hydrogen economy, most of them require a good foundation in maths mm. and science. Really, if we are to encourage our learners to take maths literacy, we really are killing our country. For us to be able to build uh, and ensure that this economic, uh, our economy grows, we really need to invest in maths and science. And the role of career guidance is quite important there. Mm. We really need, and it begins at home. Mm -hmm. It begins in our cycle of influence mm. to, uh, to make our uh, fellow uh, mothers and fathers to say, educate them about the importance of maths and science. So that even when they are at home, they are beginning to actually uh, advise even their learners the importance of maths and science because the occupations that are in demand in South Africa and globally requires that we have a good foundation in maths and science. And what we are also seeing is that, I think colleagues have already highlighted that, there's a, a, a global a demand in the, of uh, digital skills there are job opportunities created within the digital space, but is our education and training system mm. responsive enough? That for us will always remain a, a challenge. I mean, we are producing the list of occupations in high demand, and I understand that also from our side, we need to uh, ad build advocacy and improve our implementation. But the fact of the matter is that if there is a shortage, for example, we are saying we don't have engineers, I'm just giving uh, an example, in the country right now. And then we then say that we can use the critical skills list to get foreign nationals to come and assist us in those areas area so that critical uh, government projects are implemented while we are beginning to put uh, measures in place, in place to ensure that we produce people with the right skills to develop a, 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 a qualification or even put together curriculum 
take quite a long period of time. So we are chasing, we are constantly chasing the evolving uh, digital uh, technology, which makes it difficult for us to actually uh, uh, keep pace. But we also, with the re reconceptualization of the human resource development strategy, beginning to foreground and uplift the importance of sk uh, short skills programs. Mm -hmm. Because we are saying that in mm -hmm. the IT space, employers don't actually need uh, a qualification. I think Ravi, in our discussion prior to uh, us coming here, emphasized uh, the fact that, you know, Experience is important. Mm. You know, if you have done a short skills program and you get the right experience, you will be employable, you know, in occupations such as those in the IT space. So I think we need to begin to come up with different mechanisms to ensure that we providing the necessary uh, uh, opportunities that our, uh, our students need. And I think other one important point that I wanted to mention, colleagues talks about, talked about uh, uh, people who are not in employment, education, and training, and the numbers are increasing. And in the department, we have been looking at ways of getting to those people. Because normally we're saying they are 3.5, but that number is based on the quarterly labor force survey. Mm. We know that is a sample. We don't know who those people are. And then we began to look at various platforms and databases that exist in government to allow us to begin to know and uh, uh, go straight to those people who are need. We're working very closely with SASA. We're using some of their grants as a proxy. Uh, for need so that we are able to know what their aspirations are because if we are to come up with interventions We need to know who Ketiwe is, mm -hmm. you know, we need to know what her aspirations are We need to know if she's got experience or not so that even the interventions that we're putting in place are aligned to what she is aspiring to be doing so we currently are uh, in the process of putting a database of all the people who are not in employment, education, and training, so that we begin to develop or come up with interventions to ensure that we either integrate them in our education and training system or offer them uh, opportunities through our sector education uh, uh, and training uh, authorities. Thank you so much, Mampoku, and I think you've raised many critical points. Um, I think one of the things I really want to double click on is um, really getting to the practicality, you know, in terms of how do we practically start to solve and not react, you know. Um, so the World Economic Forum's latest Future of Jobs report shows that 23% of all jobs globally um, will change by 2027, noting that job losses are set to outpace growth in the employment opportunities in the short term. According to the report, the adoption of technology and increasing digital access will result in an anticipated 69 million new jobs being created and 83 million jobs being eliminated. It anticipates the fastest growing jobs will be artificial intelligence, which we spoke about earlier on, machine learning, um, as well as um, technology specialists, you spoke about green jobs, sustainability specialists, business intelligence analysts, and information security specialists. 2027 is three years away. So a person who is starting first year should be starting to study what would be produced by 2027. Mm -hmm. So how do we practically make that a reality or start charting the way forward. You spoke about how long it takes to change our curriculum. Mm -hmm. This is part of the red tape that actually disadvantages us. Mm -hmm. How do we also leverage and have an integrated higher education framework, as you said, mm -hmm. where we leverage the skills programs that you spoke about? The incentives are there, you know, but how do we accelerate the pockets of excellence mm -hmm. like the YES for example, where we leverage the CETAs, mm -hmm. we leverage the critical list, the practicality. Mm -hmm. 2027 is three years away. Mm -hmm. 
we have all the uh, necessary uh, research, we have all the necessary evidence, we are engaging and collaborating with our various stakeholders. But for me, really, the other key challenge that we normally don't talk about is that we can do all of these things, but if our economy is growing, is not growing, we will still be educating people for unemployment. I think our starting point has to ensure that there is uh, growth uh, in terms of our economy, there are jobs opportunities that are created so that even when our graduates are leaving the education and training system, they are able to then find employment in the labor market. But then again, we are saying that even employers need to also come on board. Mm. I mean, uh, Ravi mentioned, uh, I think, 300 the opportunities that you have created through the year's program. But when we're looking at what is cut, the opportunities that are created through our sector education and training authorities are way less than what has been created through the YES program. So we're also saying that we need to look into the entire skills levy, a skills levy system to try and understand where are the gaps. You know, because some of the uh, findings that we're finding is that CITAS uh, do not want to find programs that don't fall within their particular sector, which I think is one area that needs to be uh, addressed. If there are opportunities, for example, in the mining sector, all the CITAS needs to find a way of ensuring that they enable our unemployed graduates to take on board those particular uh, uh, opportunities. And again, the importance of short skills program. Mm. While we're waiting for the development of qualifications, while we're waiting for our students to go into the, uh, to complete their three year qualifications, those that are unemployed can begin to take on board the short skills programs to enable them to find employment in real time. I think those are some of the, uh, and again, one important, one last thing, you know, we are having a partnerships, for example, with various uh, countries where we're offering quite a number of scholarships uh, so that our learners can also go and study in other countries because we've said that if we don't have those necessary qualifications in the country now and they are being offered by other countries and we are in partnership with those other countries, our learners can then take those opportunity, go study abroad, come back and in, uh, uh, find employment in the country, or even be employed in other countries. It's opportunities right now. We are living in a globalized uh, economy, and our learners need to take opportunities, uh, take advantage of opportunities that are being presented to them, be it in the country or uh, in other uh, parts of the of the world. So, how do we really? entrench and accelerate and make away the importance of lifelong learning. And the second question as well is linking to innovation. You know, so how do we look at this completely differently and dream differently? And I'm happy to hear, Mampoku, that you've spoken, you've gone on tours and you've seen what other countries are doing so that we are able to then localize, you know, those global learnings to the local context. Because we are often, as a developing country, when it comes to technological trends and um, trends, we are a follower, you know, mm -hmm. but how do we then make sure, um, Sam, taking all of this into context, you know, um, looking at one, lifelong learning and the importance of lifelong learning and micro-credentialing or short skills. We need to begin to flip the classroom uh, in the different spaces. And that is happening in some, in, in some pockets of excellence, but increasingly we need to begin to rethink the way education and training is done such that it's not about giving out material, and expecting students to uh, regurgitate it and say this is, this is a good student. And uh, there is this very good book, uh, why, why A students work for C students and B students work for the government. Uh, there, is, there is a really key thing around how C students can, and sometimes we, are, we, we are on, on, on the mind them, but how you begin to develop the mind and develop opportunities for training to be able to get some of the skills that she was talking about. That leads to job creation. 
So the discourse around here is creating jobs for the graduates. But how do you begin to form graduates who start creating jobs and start employing those A students uh, while also discouraging the B students from working for the government, but also working, begin to create more opportunities for those who are in lower levels of training. So I think for me, the first thing is really flipping the classroom, uh, what we call classroom, to be able to think, how do we develop different kinds of skills for these graduates? Very important, basic skill, financial skills. Most of the young people have no idea about financial skills. I was talking to colleagues a few months ago who have houses and loans and credit cards. They have no idea what the interest rate, the prime rate is at any point in time. That is not supposed to be happening. Young people must begin to understand how the economy is functioning and what it means to be able to take a loan here, start a business there, or, or entrepreneurial training. So that for me is the first thing. The second thing I think which uh, uh, Mampo talked talk, talk about is some of the work we have done, the demand supply relationship. Uh, sometimes we focus so much on the supply, sometimes we focus so much on the demand, but that that, that overlap between what is being demanded and what is being uh, supplied uh, needs to have different kinds of conversation. Uh, and she made the point, people are, are doing training for six months and being able to get into some kind of employment as opposed to having to go to the university and get a degree in sociology or a BA. And these are very good degree programs. But how do we begin to think within those programs to get students thinking differently about how when, when they step out of the university. The last point I will make, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if we've uh, uh, spoken about that, is the gig economy, uh, which for me is a big e economy. Uh, and when we, most often we talk about em employment figures, we talk about the formal employment. Mm -hmm. And we don't really get into the gig economy to see how many people are within this economy and how much is contributing to the economy and to job creation. How do we get to support this economy even further and better uh, in terms of loans, in terms of um, training and, and, and development. So I think that we also need to pay a little more attention on the gig economy. Uh, and even within the informal sector, mm -hmm. there are many uh, entrepreneurs who do not have access to some of this, the support that either uh, uh, the NYDA is, 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 is providing or, 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 or CEDA, but who need different kinds of support. And sometimes it's not only financial, but the soft skills, as, as we're saying, uh, to be able to say, how do we walk the journey with these people for three years, for five years, for them to be able to start something, but get it to grow. Uh, and coming back to your point of lifelong uh, learning, it's for every one of us. And as I, said, as I said, I find it very discouraging sometimes, professors or lecturers, they think that this is what has been done for the past 20 years or 30 years, and this has to continue in this way. And even those in employment need to, as you are saying, 20, 20 to, to 2028, 20, some of those who are in employment now will be perceived as being semi-skilled or unskilled because they have not upskilled themselves uh, with, the, with the changing trends. So I think there are a whole lot, lot, lot of things around lifelong learning, uh, but again, it's looking at the picture much broader than in the particular sector. Yes is a very good example of a public-private partnership, you know, um, as you elaborated earlier. Um, how can we further leverage Yes and initiatives like the Presidential Youth Employment Intervention um, to accelerate collaboration between academia, industry, and government? How do we make sure that this collaboration between um, academia, industry, and government um, is really fully entrenched because it is at the heart of a lot of this, this issue actually being resolved. So obviously, when we have very low economic growth, it means there will be high youth unemployment. Mm -hmm. um, and the biggest part of the non-growth the non is ESCOM Transnet, which is 3% of GDP, and we could even work on how many jobs that costs and so on. However, while that, so that might be the chicken or the egg, I'm not sure, mm. but that's the one. The other one is what countries all around the world are doing, and we would have to do as well, is look at how youth employment strategies can be pro-growth. Mm. For the reason you said that, you know, the labor market is changing. I mean, the bad news is the labor market, is, that change is already on the go. When we go to factories, motor car 
companies where they used to employ 100 people on, a, on the conveyor belts, now they already have 15. And a mm. little robot that they give a name to and all of that. So the change is happening. So we need, as an economy, a lot of the, the, the young skills that can fuel the growth. Because once we fix ESCOM and Transnet, if you don't have that pipeline of people who can work with the new technology, that's going to mm. be another. Mm. So you don't wait for that because companies are already adopting new yeah. technologies. So we're we looking at an example between one company that used new technology and one that didn't. It's a 37% difference in productivity. <laughs> so the company that doesn't adopt the new technology mm. is going to go goodbye mm. very soon. So they're all adopting it. So even while we're fixing the big things underpinning economic growth, the jet fuel for economic growth in the future is going to be how we identify, uh, like now, what we have to do now, mm -hmm. even now, with high unemployment of five, six million youth uh, people, of whom four and a half million are youth, we'll have to say, let's try getting the most high potential people right 100%. now, put them into the streams, the pipelines, uh, from school, linked to university, linked to jobs at the end, in the right sectors and get them going. Because we're going to need more and more of those people, even when all the restructuring the president spoke about in the soda happens and growth moves. So I think, and, and, and make no mistake, every leading country has a youth employment strategy. Mm -hmm. Ours is just like very desperate because we also want all the jobs from it. But mm -hmm. they're looking at it from skills. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's why they'll come here and offer bursaries to our best uh, uh, young people as well. The, everyone is competing for talent. So I think we're still in a reasonably good position because we have a very strong private sector and we're still producing very re uh, resilient children. Mm -hmm. Uh, so let me tell you one, one story just on like a practical thing. So whether you take it as AI or engineers. Years ago, there was a program uh, that was trying to deal with the fact that Joburg Roads didn't have enough black civil engineers. Shortage? And say, why are there so few black civil engineers? This is like 20 years ago. And they said, oh, the reason is uh, there aren't enough people with the right qualifications. Oh, okay. Went, went to Wits University. Why are there people with no qualifications coming from? Oh, they're not coming through school with C, maths, higher grade C, or whatever mm. it is. They went to the schools. Why? Uh, you know, they can't get through because they don't have the right teaching. Or whatever. So then they went to grade 9 to 12, identified the best uh, children, put them in mm. a streaming program. Mm. If you attended all your classes and you did well, you would probably end up with a C. Then there were all the bursaries waiting for you at WITS. You go to WITS, and then... You, when you finish the bits, there was Telcom uh, at the time, ESCOM, blah, 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 all those companies waiting to give you jobs. And I remember going to a graduation. I was a judge at one of the panels, Performance Excellence for the State. And I went to look at it, and there were 400 people uh, who were coming through the program, and uh, this woman next to me was crying. I said, why, why are you crying? And she said, no, that's her daughter who's just finished the program, and now she's going to Telcom Malaysia at the time. And she was a domestic worker, and her daughter's now one of the sharpshooters going into engineering, boom, boom. And the whole program cost two and a half million rand because they were mobilizing everyone's existing bursaries. This is a pipeline. Mm. And I remember speaking to one of the hotshots at the time, and I said, you know, you should do more of those. Mm. And they said, yeah, we want to, but what about all the kids we leave behind? And I thought, so now I look back, in those, and they closed the program. Mm. And I thought, in those 20 years, how many people could have come through that program. Mm. And that's why I think even though we want to fix the whole system, there are lots of people now, you, you've got to identify them and motivate them and put them in and then match them. So even when we make the big system changes, mm. there's a pipeline. So yes, in a way, it's kind of that, yeah. structured now with private sector money, that we're trying to do pipelines while the system is being uh, integrated. So it's the same approach that I just mentioned with this program. Yeah. We would say we can curate a lot of the private sector companies, but the universities and DHET, uh, all the rest can you know, bring in all their money, and then together, probably using some AI program, <laughs> we'll find the best youth in the country. Then yeah. everyone knows, I yeah. want to be like Sam. Yeah. You go, then it just, just makes, then you go to the school, why is that school not producing Sam's when the other school is producing hmm. more Sam's with the same basic resources? Then you start to work out, why is that money not working? So, so I think we've we got to start where we are, yeah. but in, in a way that just plugs us into very practical solutions.